Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is John Britton. I'm a long time school desegregation lawyer, law professor, and public advocacy advocate. I came today with my intellectual hat on in this classroom of Howard University Law School. That's the home of Charles Hamilton Houston, the father of our modern day Brown versus Board of Education thesis that Jim Crow de jure segregation was inherently unequal and a violation of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. <coughs> In the spirit of intellectual stimulation, I come to posit a provocative thesis. And the thesis is that public interest law firms should no longer take private client cases in old, moribund school desegregation lawsuits. Now, what do I mean? And this is a friendly shot at my beloved brethren down the panel who will take the stage last and destroy me in rebuttal. <laughs> Commissioner and attorney extraordinary, Mark Gross. I say this because we basically, on the civil rights side, in representing private <coughs> plaintiffs, can hardly win these old resurrected former court order desegregation cases, which, as the previous speaker mentioned, are under this standard known as the agreeing factors. And what I mean uh, by this uh, provocative <coughs> thesis is that not the community deserves representation. For, as she indicated, the United States Department of Justice brought these suits 20, 30, 40, 50, <coughs> almost 60 years ago. And they have a continuing obligation to, to uh, maintain them. And I'm talking about the private plaintiffs that are asked to come into the uh, litigation where the following takes place. Back in the late 1960s, almost 1970, 16 years after Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court finally said that the jury, jury segregated districts must dismantle the Jim Crow system and do it now. And throughout the early 1970s, the Department of Justice filed a raft of lawsuits as well as a number of private plaintiffs, even during the 1960s, to create what are known as court-ordered desegregation. And under these orders, the district court set up various systems to dismantle the Jim Crow segregation. The opposite of the dual system, one black, one white, is a unitary system. And out of that came this case called Green versus New Kent County, and these six factors in which court-ordered cases could end the order for desegregation and become, quote, unitary by satisfying these six factors dealing with students and facility and faculty, extracurricular activities, and more. And the <coughs> schools, for the most part, began the desegregation effort. And by the 1980s, these orders had become largely dormant. Mm -hmm. In fact, throughout the 90s and into the 2000s, too, <coughs> court clerks routinely, in what they call their document destruction policy, but they didn't destroy them. But in any event, you know, in corporate law, it's called document retention. But that's an oxymor oxymoron, because you're really getting rid of the document. But in any event, in their document retention policy, they shipped them off into archives. And the cases lay dormant 10, 15, 20 years. And by 2005, 2006, 2007, due to the changing demographics, the school board wanted to take action. And when they went to take action, they knew that they were under these desegregation orders. Sometimes the community complained. And as a result, it brought the cases back out of the dormant files into active litigation. Sometimes justice came in, and sometimes private lawyers such as ourselves came in. And Derek Black himself, who deserves credit, by the way, 
former law professor here at Howard, runs the leading <coughs> education blog, has the leading textbook on education law, and is my beloved mentee and good spiritual brother. He <laughs> brought one of these suits when I was chief counsel for the Lawyers Committee uh, down in Thomasville, Georgia, called Houghton versus Thomasville. And we intervened, we took up the call of the community, and we lost in the fourth circuit, the 11th circuit uh, under the standards of Green. Quite frankly, courts are tired of desegregation cases, and they don't want to deal with them any longer, and they take up tremendous resources. My beloved Mark, who will you hear from shortly, with the UNC Center for Civil Rights in the Lawyers Committee, teamed up back around 2005 or so, 2007, and we intervened in this old dormant school desegregation case in Greenville, North Carolina, in what is called Pitt County. And it was resurrected, we tried it, we lost at the district court level. Mark took it up to the Fourth Circuit for case number one and lost. He took it back again uh, in this past June. We lost again. And we lost in such a funny way. The district court had said that the case was unitary, yet the unitary status law requires the judge to make findings of fact of unitary status. He said, oh, it's all retroactive. Desegregation is over. I declare it unitary without going through. And he said, besides, the plaintiffs, they have the burden of proving that it's unitary. Oh, no. The law says the school board has the burden of proving it's unitary. Isn't that right, Marie? Yeah. And so yeah. <laughs> it went back up to the Fourth Circuit again. And they said, oh, that's all right. They had a hearing. And he declared it unitary. And the son of a bitch had the nerve to say anything. <laughs> but I declared it unitary before, so I don't see why I have to do it again. And the Fourth Circuit upheld it, except for our beloved brother, Judge Wynn in a dissent who said it didn't make sense. And so that's my thesis, that private parties should stop coming into these old more bound cases. Now the Justice Department, along with Marie, has done a valiant job in Huntsville. I was asked to come into Huntsville, up by the Herford family and other civil rights agitators. And I thought hard, I think long. My conscience was panging me. And I said, I can't let the people down, like I've always said, but I stuck to my rule. We can't really win this. And of course, there was a lot of dissension in the community. It woke up sleeping dogs. School boards don't want to bring these unitary status because they don't want to wake up the community. And the community doesn't want to deal with them until the school board gets ready to do something bad that they don't like. And so everybody comes together in the uh, unitary status, kind of what you would call shotgun marriage. <laughs> you have to uh, go to court and try and litigate it. And, as he said, they went through a long trial, and the judge gave a wonderful opinion on the whole 50-year history of school desegregation in Huntsville, came to the conclusion that she couldn't decide whether it was unitary or not. She, as indicated, mandated that they go through mediation, and as you heard, they reached the settlement. <coughs> That's all well and good. Let the Justice Department do it. It's not for private parties. That's my thesis. What do you say, Mark? <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning, good morning. I am. Uh, I'm going to pick up the gauntlet that my comrade here threw down, and on this question of whether litigation under these old desegregation orders is still a viable alternative. If this was the debating side, I would, society, I would take the pro side. And I just want to say that um, John's description or summary of the Pitt County case was so eloquent. I wish I hope we had that on video, because I'm going to use that to show to my students and funders. But, but I want to point out there's a couple of folks here who worked on that case with the Center for Civil Rights. Brenda Shum from the Lawyers Committee, Genevieve Siegel Hawley was our expert witness, and John Britton himself, despite his his, uh, his, you know, his new born again status on these things. <laughs> so one of the instigators of this litigation. So, so um, I do want to uh, take the position defending this litigation, although I, I would be wrong to say I have not been somewhat chastened by our experience at Pitt County and, and the Fourth Circuit's uh, second ruling. So this case from Pitt County was one of the most recent 
uh, unitary status cases to be tried and to get um, circuit court opinions in the last few years. And, and one aspect of it, which is, I think, one of the reasons why it remains critical to do this work, is because it started out uh, as a result of challenges by white parents who claimed that they were being discriminated against by a school district at that time that was still using a student assignment plan that considered race. And so, so you had, um, the, the case came back into court, as, as uh, Comrade Britton pointed out, as a result of um, complaints from white parents of reverse discrimination. And as civil rights advocates, I think it's critical that, to engage that issue independent of schools whenever we have the opportunity to do so. Um, certainly, and that's how a host of these cases came up, including um, the Charlotte Mecklenburg litigation that, um, that ended with them being Indeed, declared. The white parents intervened. That's right. <laughs> so, so one of, the, one of the important issues in these cases, I think, and I'll talk more about this in a second, is context. But as a, as, as a litigator, as I like to say, just a country lawyer, um, you know, one of the reasons that we, these cases remain valuable is the burden of proof issue. So if you were to go into court um, to challenge, as we was the, the issue in Pitt County, a student reassignment plan that increased segregation, a school district had alternatives that would have met all their stated criteria, student achievement, capacity, um, uh, transportation, um, but they chose the, an alternative plan that, that increased segregation. So if we were to try to challenge that in a district that had never been under court order or that had been declared unitary, you all know the burden of proof would have been on the plaintiffs to show that that was intentional race discrimination in choosing that, that policy. <coughs> and of course, that is a virtually insurmountable burden. Mm -hmm. So, but for a district that's still under court order, as, as John mentioned, the burden of proof is still on the school district. And when we first went into court the first time in Pitt County, we were challenging the school district to meet its burden to show why the plan that they had selected not only uh, moved them towards <laughs> unitary status, was consistent with their uh, obligations under the court order. And that's in that first round of litigation, the judge got it wrong. He put the burden of proof on the plaintiffs, said you lose. We went up to the Fourth Circuit, and we won at the Fourth Circuit the first time in a very um, exciting decision, very um, uh, well-drafted, reaffirm the kind of principles that a district under court order still has these obligations. It was a positive ruling, and if anything, encouraged me to continue this strategy. Um, then we went back down, and then the judge said, you know what, and now that I think about it, they're actually unitary. So, um, but, but the truth is, the burden of proof does, it makes a significant difference. And that's one of the considerations that you have to take. If, we, if, if the clients had come to us and said, we want to challenge this reassignment plan, and it was, again, a district that had not been under court order, had been declared unitary, we likely wouldn't have taken the case. We wouldn't have brought an equal protection claim because the chances of success would have been so minimal. Um, the second aspect of these court orders that, that was also a key component in the Pitt County case is the obligation of good faith. So one of the keys, and, and I know this isn't a law school class on, on education law, but one of the keys for districts um, under court order, in addition to the green factors that John mentioned, is this continuing obligation to act in good faith, to act in good faith to eliminate the vestiges of discrimination. Um, and so, you know, and we've heard some of this in the opening plenary and, and some of the discussions we'll hear today, you know, we're at a point in advocacy where one huge component of it is trying to make diversity and integration a political priority for school boards, for city councils, for, for state legislatures, as Myron just mentioned. Um, but when you're representing communities that are disenfranchised, literally, or alienated from the political process, or have no political pressure, it becomes much harder. It becomes much harder for African American and Latino parents to push a majority white school board to say, you need to make a decision that's going to prioritize diversity. The, the good faith burden gives you an opportunity to push for those policies <coughs> without having that political power. So that's the second aspect of it. The third reason why these, I think, continue to be important is, and something that John alluded to, is the value in supporting community organizing and community advocacy. So what we know in, at the Center for Civil Rights, and many of, of you know as, as community lawyers, as social just, justice lawyers, in the current model, is not leading with litigation. It's supporting communities in the priorities that they identify, of which litigation may be one tool. And in some cases, litigation, even 
ultimately unsuccessful litigation, has intrinsic value in supporting community-based organizing and community-based advocacy. So that's, and, and the call of the community, I like that expression that, that, that John used, um, is, is a powerful one. The fourth reason why I think these cases can still be important is the importance of context. And one of the challenges, um, and if you think about the parents involved decision and the push back against civil rights, not just in education, but broadly, is the modern um, anti-civil rights strategy of decontextualizing race. So according to John Roberts and some of his <laughs> colleagues and some of the uh, anti-civil rights folks we, we face, um, there is no past. If there is no legacy or history of segregation and discrimination. The way things are today are just the way they are. We just woke up one day, black folk lived over here, white folk lived over there, people wanted to go to the schools closest to their house. That's just the way it is. Well, that's not, that is, a, that is a decontextualized vision of history, of our history of segregation, and of the continuing current impacts, the housing um, that Myron mentioned, the continuing impacts and legacies of those which are felt not just in education, but in some cases most significantly in education. And so putting that into context, yes, people said, well, you're dusting off a order from 1971. We don't even know where it is. We have to go to the National Archives in Atlanta to find it. But the fact is, the, dis the, dis the discrimination, the segregation, the racialized impacts that were seen in the schools in Pitt County clearly had their roots in their legacy and the history of segregation there. So, the, the last um, point, though, I, I want to end with is, you know, in the, in the post-Pitt County sort of debrief and the review, we learned a lot of things, including that some courts are not really interested in any of those things that I just mentioned. And so, so we, we did a lot of research looking at districts in North Carolina that were still under court, court order. There's about 11 of them. There are hundreds across the South. And one of the things that is critical, I think, in bringing any of these cases is looking closely at the facts on the ground. Some schools did a pretty good job in the wake of the desegregation orders to, to make efforts to integrate. Um, some schools did a very poor job. So there's another district in North Carolina where it's clear, I think, that a challenge under the existing court order would be much more successful. It's a district that part of their court order was to merge a city and a county district city was all black, the county was all white. They did merge that, but what they did was just erase the administrative line. So now they have one district, they have a city school attendance area, which is basically <laughs> the old city school district, and they have a county school attendance area. So there is still opportunities to do that, but, but also we, it has helped us um, work on developing some new strategies to look at education and race. And so just a few weeks ago, we filed a, a, a brand new case in Halifax County, North Carolina, a rural county that has three school districts in this very small, 7,000 kids, three school districts, two are 99 to 100% African American, one is 75% white in a county that's over, the school age population is over 70% African American. In that case, we looked at bringing an equal protection claim and we concluded it wouldn't be a good strategy. What we did was we filed a claim under the state constitution and the right to a sound basic education. And, um, under the what's called the Leandro case line of cases, these, these sound basic education cases, you don't have to prove intent. They're more like disparate impact cases. The question of whether students are getting a sound basic education or not <coughs> is an empirical one that can be shown through a series of metrics that the Supreme Court in North Carolina and other states has recognized. The other thing about at least the case in North Carolina is the, the precedents have established that every student has this right to a sound basic education but that at-risk students have particularly been failed by the state and by the school districts in doing that. And the court identified at-risk students and who, the, the sub-metrics. And it includes low, students from low-wealth families, students getting free and reduced lunch, racial and ethnic minorities, English language learners. And so what we see, what we hope to see in this litigation is an opportunity to, um, to really integrate um, the idea of adequacy education, sound basic education, with the continuing issues of segregation and resegregation. Thank you. I will admit, it was kind of an artificial, provocative thesis to stimulate debate between two friends to give the audience some kind of thrill. <laughs> I will say, in support, of one of Mark's 
goals about supporting the community. In 2007, I was amazed that down there in Little Pitt County, the coalition that we helped support and intervene in the case consisted of the NAACP, SCLC, I didn't even know it still existed oh, there, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. Martin Luther King, a group of progressive radicals largely out of East Carolina University in the name of anti-racism, an NCAR committee against racism, and a kind of black nationalist that ran a charter school, OB, and who believed in culturally responsive teaching, CRT. And that was the group waging the fight against the uh, Pitt County School Board, and that was worth bringing the suit. <laughs> I'll, I'll add 45 seconds. I think actually we both right in some respect. I mean, and you're right in that the law is there to win the case. And I think that what's interesting about Thomasville and Pitt County is they both won in the appellate court for the first time they went up. And this comes back to the question of who has the burden. And ultimately, if a trial court says it has given the plaintiff the benefit of the burden or has placed the burden on the defendant, disproving that the court has actually placed that burden on uh, the defendant is a very hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. You have to dig through, you know, a couple thousand pages of transcript to figure that out. And I think it's a lot for a court of appeals to be able to say, you know what, that trial court judge actually didn't place the burden on the defense. He says he did, or she says she did. And I think that's really the problem. If the trial court, at the end of the day, can get reversed <coughs> and then ultimately do whatever they want to.